Hello and welcome to week one. Our topic for this week is infection control, routine precautions, and personal protective equipment or what we call PPE. We're also going to touch on uh, confidentiality and privacy. So I'm going to go through some slides. Um, we'll do um, some case studies and I'll give you some practice multiple choice questions to help you to understand the content for this week. We'll start with infection control. Okay. When we think about uh, infection, we always have to think about the chain of infection. And so this, if this chain remains intact, then um, an organism, a microorganism can be passed from one person to the next uh, to infect a, a new person. So um, what we have to remember that is if, if we can take steps as a nurse then to break that chain of infection, we're going to prevent the transmission of microorganisms from one person to the next. Okay, so the idea that just because we have a pathogen present doesn't mean that infection will begin if we can take the steps then um, to prevent that transmission. So we're going to go through each of the, the um, steps in the chain of infection and really think about the role of the nurse in trying to break that chain. So when we think about the infectious agent, that's really that microorganism and the way that we can break the chain right at this um, part is really through controlling or eliminating that infectious agent. So we do that by physically removing um, any um, objects that may have or have the potential to have an infectious agent um, on it. Okay, And we call that cle cleaning when we just physically remove them from the area. Um, we also do what we call disinfection and that's um, where we chemically eliminate all pathogens. And then there's also sterilization, which is where we use steam under pressure to then eliminate all pathogens. And then the interesting thing about sterilization is that it can remove it can remove all pathogens. And in addition, it can eliminate what we call spores. So cleaning and keeping the area clean, disinfected or even sterilizing our equipment before we use it between patients can help us to break the chain of infection at the infectious agent. Uh, the next part is really um, the reservoir, and this is really the habitat in which the, um, the normal microorganism would live, grow, and multiply. Okay, uh, And it can include things like humans on animals or even places within our environment. Okay, And so the reservoir may or may not be the source from which the agent is transferred to the host, but it would be a place where that it would reside and multiply. So ways that we eliminate or control reservoirs um, is really um, getting rid of them or cleaning them. Okay, so bathing, changing the dressing on a wound because the microorganisms can actually grow in that dressing. So changing those regularly are ways that we can do that. Okay, disposing of contaminated articles and equipment after they've been used. Okay. Cleaning and drying different surfaces within the patient environment. Okay. Uh, and emptying drainage systems uh, every shift. So thinking about even emptying a urine bag or a wound drainage system. All of those would help to, to eliminate that reservoir and prevent that microorganism from growing and multiplying. Okay. So these are just an example of a few common reservoirs that you will see as you enter into the clinical practice setting. So trying to keep and um, um, empty those receptacles is going to help with eliminating that reservoir. The next part of the chain is the portal of exit. Okay, and this is really the path by which the pathogen is going to leave its host. Okay, it generally corresponds to the site where the pathogen is localized within the body. Okay, so for example, things like influenza and tuberculosis would exit via the respiratory tract because that's really where they're localized. Um, but you know, so we want to really prevent it then from exiting that body. Okay, so things like having the patient wear a mask, or even if we're sick, wearing a mask. Okay, avoid sneezing and coughing into the patient's face or even into an open wound or dressing would help to also eliminate this one. Okay, um, making sure, you know, if a patient is blowing their nose regularly, that they're disposing of the this, this supplied tissues that they're using in a, in a proper receptacle or bag. Okay, um, and again, carefully handling things like bloods and body fluids, such as urine, feces, um, 
vomit, those types of things, um, and disposing of them appropriately will also help eliminate this one. The next one is really controlling the transmission. And I would say the number one way that we control transmission and even the number one way that we really break this chain of infection is through our own hand washing. And you'll learn that this week in lab, the importance of really good hand washing. So um, the transmission is really how it, the microorganism is transferred from its natu nat natural reservoir to the susceptible, susceptible host. Okay, and so we have a number of different ways that this happens. It can be through things like contact, through droplets, through coughing or airborne. Okay, it can be through vector, which is a which is a mosquito or a flea or vehicle through things like our food or water and our blood. Okay, so ways that we control that uh, the transmission of a microorganism, I said, is washing hand. Um, we don't share personal items between clients. So if we empty uh, a urine um, bag into a, a container to measure. We don't use that same container to measure for more than one client. Um, we don't share bedpans, urinals, or even basins that we wash clients with. Okay, um, And even with thermometers, we have thermometer probe covers, and those are changed after each client. Okay. So these are different ways of controlling the transmission. Okay, and I also talked about the different modes of transmission. So these are really, really important. So contact. Okay, that means that the microorganism is spread by touch. Okay, so um, there's what we call direct contact, which is skin to skin, or there's indirect contact, which would be the contaminated object is then uh, touched to another susceptible host. So um, the way I like to think about it is uh, direct contact. The, the client coughs in their hand and then you shake your hand because your skin is touching their skin with the microorganism on it, this would be considered direct contact. An example of indirect contact would really then be thinking about the use of a stethoscope. So you go in and you're doing a respiratory assessment on a client, okay? You touch your stethoscope to different parts of their body to listen and auscultate, okay? You then leave, you leave the room and you go and you assess another patient without washing that stethoscope, you then indirectly um, may transfer that microorganism to another person. Okay, so that's contact. Um, droplet um, is really large droplets that propel up to one meter. And so an example is just through coughing and sneezing. So um, things like the flu, rubella, and different um, respiratory um, infections will definitely be transmitted through droplet contact. And so um, even things like putting a mask on yourself or the patient will help to prevent the spread through droplet. Okay. Airborne is similar, uh, except the droplets are far smaller and they, they can move through the air a further di uh, distance. Okay. Uh, and they stay in the air for longer periods of time. Um, so again, this is when you're going to use those N95 masks to prevent that spread. And you'll all have your masks fitting in the coming weeks to go. Okay. So it's really important um, when we look at um, organisms and we're trying to understand um, what the precautions might be that we determine whether or not they are droplet or airborne because what we would wear would be slightly different for one versus the other. Uh, transmission through vehicle is really through things like water, food, or equipment, okay? And the last one is vector-borne, which is transmission through insects or pests. So malaria or West Nile, things where they're transmitted through things like a mosquito would be an example of vector-borne. So those are really the modes of transmission. And it's really, really important that you're able to think about um, the type of infection um, like something like MRSA and be able to identify that it's a contact precaution. That's going to be really, really important as you move forward in this course uh, and in preparing for that test as well. And knowing things like influenza is droplet. Okay. The next one is controlling that portal of entry. Okay, so this is really how that pathogen then enters that susceptible host. Okay, and so things like skin integrity are going to play a big role in this. If, if clients have a lot of cracks and open wounds in their skin, there's going to be more opportunities uh, for pathogens to enter into, into their body. OK, 
Okay, so we do things like moisturizing skin, turning people to prevent skin breakdown, uh, to decrease their risk and susceptibility. Um, things like frequent oil, oral hygiene and lubricating their lips to prevent cracked lips helps. Okay, um, and um, you know, using dry, wrinkle-free linen to prevent bed sores and things like that on the body. Okay. Um, so all of those are going to be ways um, that we then reduce that pathogen entering that susceptible host. Okay. The host then really is that person um, that that, that it couldn't infect. So it could be anybody, it could be even ourselves. And so we really need to think about using the appropriate protections or what we call PPE for all patients in any setting. Okay, so this is things like applying gowns, gloves, masks, or eyewear to prevent the spreading of microorganisms from, um, from that host to another susceptible host. Okay, so thinking about uh, for airborne precautions, which we talked about earlier as a mode of transmission, okay, we would have the patient in a private room, it would need to be negative pressure, a negative pressure room, okay, and the um, healthcare professional would wear um, gown, gloves, mask, and the N95 mask in particular, okay. Similarly, if they have a droplet precautions, they would again be given a private room, okay, we would keep the door closed and you would wear gown, gloves, and mask. Contact, either direct or indirect, is going to again be a private room. They're going to have gloves, gown, uh, and we're going to limit contact between patients. Okay. So it's really, really important that you are able to match and identify if someone has an airborne precaution, this is the personal protective equipment that I need to be able to put on. Okay, and be able to recognize that and do that. When we don uh, personal protective equipment, we always do hand hygiene. Okay, then we put on our gown, our mask, our goggles, and our gloves. Okay, when we remove it, uh, we're putting on, we're taking off our gloves, we're then performing hand hygiene. We take off our gown, we again perform hand hygiene. We would then remove our mask our goggles, sorry, and then our mask. And once again, we would provide hand hygiene. What I will note for you though, is that sometimes uh, the textbook may say to have goggles and mask in a reverse order. And I think you need to really think about um, that goggles rest outside of the upper part of the mask. Therefore, you can't always remove the mask without removing the goggles first. And what you will see is that some institutions will actually have a face mask um, with a face shield that goes and protects over the eyes all in one piece. And so you would then remove that all together in, rather than goggles and masks because they would be all one, okay? So that is really um, a lot about infection control and personal protective equipment. I'm gonna do um, show you a case study just to get you really thinking about this content, okay? So Sean is a nurse in a long-term care facility and he's assigned to a client with a respiratory infection. The client is symptomatic, meaning they're coughing and they're showing symptoms of that respiratory uh, infection, and they require various degrees um, of nursing care. So what I want you to do is consider how Shaw would meet the standard in relation to infection control and reduce the risk of spreading that infection to, the, to another client, to himself and to others. So pause for a minute and really think about what are the things that Sean should be doing that relate back to our chain of infection in order to break um, that chain. So if you've thought about it, um, this is sort of the answer. Sean would meet that standard by knowing that a respiratory illness is transferred through airborne and droplet mechanisms, okay? And recognizing that, he would also go and look at and determine whether it is airborne or droplet so that he can don the appropriate personal protective equipment. Okay. He would then so select the appropriate precautions and he would wear those um, every time that he enters into the room to make contact with that client. The other thing that's really, really important to consider when you start to, to wear personal protective equipment is thinking about the impact that that has on the client. 
If I walked into the room on my first day with you and I had a, a big gown on, gloves on, uh, a full face mask with a face shield, how would that make you feel? Just think about that for a moment because that's a, a lot of times the way that this come, that this is felt by the client. And so we have to be really, really sensitive about the impact that that has. They can't see when we smile at them. They can't see our eyes and what, how we're looking at them so that we can connect with them therapeutically. So we really have to try and um, then um, make that personal relationship with the client despite these barriers. The other thing that Sean could do would be to wash his hands before and after using the personal protective equipment and, and, and uh, in between clients, okay? Um, and also ensuring that any equipment removed from the client's room is cleaned with appropriate disinfectant. Mm -hmm. The last thing he could do really is advocating for equipment that remains in the client's isolation room. So we know that because he has a, this client has a respiratory illness and they're either on droplet or airborne precautions, that they're not likely to have other people in the room with them. Okay, And so we would want to make sure that there's a blood pressure cuff and that there's um, a basin and those types of things to provide care to that client and that those items remain in the in the room so that um, there, there's not the chance of them being used on someone else without being properly disinfected. So that really is um, how Sean could really consider some of the principles and the chain of infection in order to break that chain and prevent the spread of that. The other case study that I really want to look at you with and I want to introduce you to this client is going to be Mrs. Beauchamp. Okay, so we're going to talk about her sort of each week in relation to the different content areas that we're talking about. So Mrs. Beauchamp is a 69 year old. She's female and she's widowed. Okay, um, she is retired and she had a total left uh, knee replacement three, three days ago. Okay, so she's receiving care to support her transition home in the next few days. So when we think about the content for today, how does the nurse use routine precautions to reduce the risk of transmitting an infection to Mrs. Pochamp? So I want you to work through these um, and put your answers down and we're gonna talk about them next week in class. What are the specific things that you would do as a nurse to break that chain of infection? The other thing that I want you to look up uh, in your textbook is what is a healthcare associated infection? What does that mean? So we've now learned that Mrs. Beauchamp has a productive cough, malaise, fever, and dehydration. She's also been having diarrhea since completing a course of antibiotics for a wound infection in her knee. The patient is tested, tested for what we call C. diff and influenza, and both of those tests come back positive. So I want you to um, take, uh, take a look at um, what type of transmission C. diff and influenza are, okay? And what actions will we then use to break the chain of infection and prevent these from spreading uh, to other patients? So those should be listed within your textbook. So go and have a look at that. What would you do? What personal protective equipment might you put on, okay? Um, and then what type of hand hygiene would you use for this patient? So we know that we have, we can wash with soap and water or we can use the antiseptic um, solution. So which one would you choose um, given the information that you know about the client and why? Uh, what personal protective equipment would you wear prior to entering home? So think about these questions, write down your answers and bring them next week. And we're gonna take this up. Other question I want you to think about, um, what routine precautions would be applied uh, prior to knowing whether the client tests positive? So you're with Mrs. Beauchamp and you're the nurse and you're seeing all of these symptoms. You notify the physician and he orders the, the test for C. diff and influenza. So what would you do before you had confirmation that they had? It? Would you just continue as, as normal? Would you start to wear your PPE? What would you need to do to protect yourselves and others? And then again, what types of things would you do to consider the impact of wearing personal protective equipment on the nurse-client relationship?
What are some strategies that you think that you would use as a nurse to minimize the impact of it? So I'll leave those with you and we'll take them up next week. I have a couple um, review multiple choice questions that I will run through with you quickly. If an infectious disease can be transmitted directly from one person to another, it's called which of the following? The answer is B. A patient who has been admitted to your unit has been identified as being colonized uh, by MRSA. Which measures should be taken to prevent the spread of MRSA to other patients on the unit? The answer is A. MRSA is contact precautions. Okay, if you go and look it up, so you would place the patient in a single or private room and put them on contact. A patient is isolated because he has TB. The nurse knows that the patient seems angry, but knows that this is a normal response to isolation. What is the best intervention? The answer is B. When should a gown be worn? The answer is D. To remove a glove that is contaminated, what should the nurse do first? The answer is C. What is the single most eff effective method by which the nurse can break the chain? The answer is C. Hand washing is the single most effective thing that we can do to protect our patients. Which of the following statements reflects the current trend in the directives from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention for minimizing the risk of infection? The answer is D. So thinking about keeping all of drainage tubes below the level of the waist. So if a client has a catheter uh, and the catheter is draining into a bag, we know that that urine uh, can be a reservoir. So what we want to prevent is that urine going from the um, drainage bag back into the bladder by lifting that uh, drainage bag above the level of the, west, the waist. Sorry. So we always keep the drainage tubes below the level of the insertion site. The nurse has just admitted a patient to rule out Alzheimer's disease. The patient is confused and spitting on everyone who enters the room. What should the nurse do? The answer is B. Use gloves, mask, a face shield, and a gown when entering the room to perform the initial assessment. We don't know whether or not there's a micro, uh, that this patient has an infection or um, and so we want to prevent the spread of microorganisms from that patient to even yourself. And so we would call that just routine precautions of looking at the situation, thinking about the risk for the spread of that infection, and then of donning the appropriate personal protective equipment. So that really concludes um, the, the topic of infection control and PPE. There is an online quiz that you can go on and try and practice uh, in terms of um, getting ready for the test in week three. So I will suggest that you go and look there. Um, the second part of today's topic is really um, confidentiality and privacy. So I'm going to I'm going to transition into that topic now. OK, um, so we have what we call the Personal Health Information Protection Act. OK, and that is the health information privacy privacy legislation. It came into effect in 2004 and it really regulates how we collect use and disclose of personal health information. 
Okay. This um, act applies to all health care organizations, big, big hospitals, even small, small uh, doctors type offices. Okay. It applies to all health care providers and the staff that work within those. Okay. Um, so we have what we call an Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. And this really is the person that's responsible um, for putting for setting this these rules that govern how we use, disclose, um, and collect health information. So who does this PIPA, this Personal Health Information Protection Act, we call PIPA, but who does it apply to? So it applies to what we call health information custodians and agents. So a health information custodian um, would be the big healthcare organization or the independent provider, such as a hospital, a pharmacy, a laboratory, even a dental clinic, and your family doctor would all be considered health information custodians. An agent then would be someone like uh, a nurse working within that hospital. And so when you graduate, it's very likely that you will work as the agent of one of these health information custodians. Okay. Um, and so um, all of the agents and the health information consultants and are responsible for understanding PIPA and applying and, and applying it appropriately within the healthcare environment. So when we think about what is what is health, personal health information, we have to think about it as any information uh, on physical or mental health or any sort of test results of a client. Okay. Um, any sort of information that would identify a healthcare provider or a service that would be would have been provided to a client. Okay. Any information that would identify a substitute decision maker. Okay. It would be any information such as a health card number or an insurance number or insurance company or something that would communicate eligibility for healthcare. Okay. So when I think about personal health information. I really think about it as anything that relates to the client um, and the health care that's being provided to them. So just, you know, siding on that as caution of basically everything that you do as a nurse when you're communicating about a client with a client or about a client with the healthcare team will help you to understand and understand which imp information that you've gathered applies to this PIPA. Okay. Um, and so PIPA's principles are that patients have a right to access and to correct their uh, personal health information. And so um, they can do this, but it doesn't mean that they can just go look up their own records. Um, they have, there's a process that they have to follow in relation to that. And each agency will have their own process of how they access their records. Um, they can make a formal request through the various channels um, to do that, okay? The other principle, uh, is that there's this idea of a lockbox, which means that the patient at any time has the right to withdraw full or partial consent for the collection, use, and disclosure of their personal health information. Okay, um, and this just means that if you know they decide that they don't want to provide any more information or that they don't want to consent to their information being used anymore, they can do that at any time. The other key thing about uh, the PIPA principles is what we call this circle of care. Okay, the circle of care encompasses all individuals involved in the health care for a patient, okay, for the purposes of health care provision. So um, the circle of care never includes any external non health care agencies. So people like insurance companies, families and friends, etc, would not be considered as part of the um, circle of care. Okay, it would be things like the physician, the nurse, the physiotherapist, all of those people that are providing direct care to that client. It doesn't mean that the other nurse that's working with you on the same shift, but not assigned to that client would not be then considered within the circle of care for that client. Okay. Um, the other thing that's important with the PIPA principles is it's on a need to know basis. So you only collect information from the patient that you require to provide direct care. And when you transfer care, say at the end of your shift to another nurse, you would only provide the information that the client has told you that is required for them to provide direct care. Okay. Um, in terms of sharing information, um, even with uh, an insurance company or a, a police officer, they would require a warrant or a subpoena for you to be able to break the PIPA in terms of sharing that information. 
Uh, or if there is an emergency situation where you believe there's an imminent risk to the, of harm to the patients, if you do not disclose this information, um, then that would be another situation where um, you would be able to share that information. Uh, and then the next thing that's important is to think about these concepts of express versus implied consent. So um, express consent needs to be uh, obtained when um, collecting, using, and disclosing information outside of the circle of care. Um, and so examples of this would be disclosing information to family, friends, or insurance companies. Um, you would need to actually have them express that you're allowed to share that information, okay? Um, it involves either verbal conversation with the patient or a documented um, uh, piece of paper that they, the client would actually written and sign consent, okay? Um, and so this really is an important part of making sure that they have given you their consent to share that information. Imp implied consent, on the other hand, would be used within the circle of care, and it's based on the client's actions or inactions. Okay, so if, for example, if a client presents to you at your clinic and you and you begin to ask them questions and they answer those questions, it's implied consent that you that they want you to collect their information for the use of providing care to them. Okay. And likewise, if another clinic requests copies of a client's health record from your clinic. Um, because you've transferred them over to them, it would be implied consent would be relied on because um, they're now within the circle of care because they're, the care has been transferred over to that other clinic. Okay. So that's really the difference between the two. Okay. Um, and so we need to, to be aware of when we would use implied versus express consent. Um, the other thing to think about is we always ensure so thinking about when you're talking with your client, how loud you're talking. When you're talking within the circle of care of the healthcare team, where are you talking? Are you in the hallway and there's other patients and families there that could overhear you? Okay, so thinking about that. So um, think about auditory privacy, things like using a private consultation room, um, keeping your voices low are all going to be things that you could you could do, okay? Remember that no cell phones in the clinic or at any of the placement settings that you're going to be going to because things like taking pictures, there may be a client in the background, even if you think you're taking a picture of just a peer, we don't do that, okay? Um, and then physical safeguards for ensuring privacy, right? So securing any paper files, making sure that um, charts and that paper charts are put away, um, having strong passwords and lock, logging off of your screens before you walk away from the electronic charting programs is another way. Um, limiting access based on need to know. Okay, so only share information that's needed and necessary for the job. Okay, you would never go on to the charting system and look up information on a client or an individual that you're not providing direct care for because you are not being considered within the circle of care and that is not your information to then access. Another way we ensure privacy is training all staff on our privacy responsibility and things like PIPA and, and hospital policies are created to help maintain privacy within the center. Other things that we can do uh, is thinking about social media and privacy. So I know many of you will have Facebook and Twitter and Instagram accounts, but think about your online reputation and your professional reputation. You've now entered into the profession of nursing and the two really are blurred. Okay, so think about if, you know, if you're an employer saw some of the things that you put onto your social media sites, would you be proud uh, of, of them viewing those things and would they look at those favorably? Because I'm certain that they will go and do that when it's time for hiring. Okay. Uh, and so remember that misusing of social, social media, like posting pictures of your client or it, details about your client that make them identifiable have some significant penalties within our profession. Okay, they're right, they're investigated by our regulatory body. Okay, and they can result in things like suspensions and termination from school and work and fines and even lawsuits. Okay, so really what happens at your placements always stays at your placements. These are just a few examples of some of the social media um, consequences that have happened to others within the profession of nursing. Um, and so some tips for social media, never post pictures or comments about a client. Okay. Uh, never comment 
or complain or criticize or threaten a coworker, an institution or a teacher. Keep your work and your school life and your personal life separate. Okay, remember that everything that you post online can be public, even with the strictest privacy settings. Okay. And there is privacy breaches and they can happen due to improper use, collection, disclosure or destruction of, destruction of personal health information. And again, if you suspect a breach, you know, you need to, to, to look at uh, in your institution what should be followed and who you should be notifying about. So that is really uh, the topic of um, confidentiality and privacy. Again, I just have a few more multiple choice questions to get you thinking about um, how you might be tested on some of this content. So the first one, what does IPC stand for? The answer is C, Information and Privacy Commissioner. The primary, the primary privacy legislation that you, as a future healthcare provider, are concerned with is HIPAA, Personal Health Information Protection Act. Which of the following could be a penalty or consequence for breaching privacy? Privacy, sorry. All of the above. Um, clients trust as a professional that you will not share their information with anyone not involved in their care. Which of the following should you do if you need to share information? The answer would be that ensure that the person that you're sharing the information with is in the circle of care. If not, then you need expressed written consent for that. Do people have the right to access their own personal health information? They do, but there's a process they need to follow in order to do that. Even the identity of someone's healthcare provider counts as their personal health information and must be kept confidential. True or false? True. Which of the statements below could be a breach of privacy? The answer is all of the above. As long as I don't use identifiable pieces of information, such as name and date of birth, it's okay to post a comment on social media about a client or patient. True or false? False. Absolutely not. Uh, what best describes expressed consent? The answer is D, documented consent. Verbal or written. What steps should you take if you suspect or witness a breach of personal information or personal health information? And the answer is C, report it to your supervisor, faculty and access uh, and to the access and privacy office. So that really is the, uh, the, the content for week one. Um, if you have any questions, please bring them to class next week. Hope you have a good week. We'll see you next week.